Welcome to Boost Child and Youth Advocacy Center's new webinar series. And my name is Pamela Rose Toulouse, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Uh, before we begin our session, everybody, there are a few quick housekeeping points. And again, so uh, listen closely. So for participants that are listening in French, kindly click on floor at the bottom left of the screen and select French. The next thing, next housekeeping item is to see and follow along with the PowerPoint presentation in English, click presentation on the top left of the screen. To follow along with the presentation in French, download the French version of the presentation by clicking on documents on the right. Feel free to download the presentation in both English and French by clicking on documents on the right. There will be a question and answer period during the last five minutes of the webinar. And to submit your question, please go to the toolbar on the right. Click on messaging and then participants and type in your question. And you can submit your questions at any time, everybody, and I will certainly do my best to answer them. And if I can't, then I will definitely, um, you know, provide information on who can. Again, folks, if you're watching this webinar as a group, uh, please enter the number of participants in the group by clicking on messaging and then participants. So now I get the honor and the privilege of beginning our webinar and discussion today. So folks, to start in a good way, and it's always important when working with Indigenous peoples to start in that good way. And I want to let you know that I'm very, very honored. I'd like to acknowledge the territory that I'm in right now. And that is the territory that is known as the One Dish, One Spoon Treaty Territory in the Greater Toronto Area. And this traditionally is the meeting point of the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee peoples. And the Anishinaabek peoples are the Ojibwe's, the Odawa's, the Potawatomi's, the Mississaugas, and the Algonquins. And the Haudenosaunee people are also known as the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Cayuga, the Oneida, the Onondaga, and the Tuscarora. So why do I start this way? And why do I start in a good way by acknowledging the territory that I'm in? Because whenever you're working in a respectful trauma practice framework with Indigenous peoples, it's really important to know the traditional territories that we're working from and that we're working within. So that's a good place to start. The other part of starting in a good way is to let you know who I am. So I gave you my English name, my Noah's win, my Pamela Rose Toulouse name. But also in my own home community, I'm known as Wase Ekawabitkwe. So that is my name. It's the name that my aunties gave me. And this is really critical when, again, working with Indigenous peoples and, again, working within a really good, respectful trauma practice framework, because a lot of Indigenous peoples may have traditional names or they may be seeking those traditional names. Wase Ekawabitkwe for me means she that looks ahead. And Genoje Dodem. So what that means is that that's the family or else the clan to which I belong. It's my it's my family grouping. And we're the original teachers, mediators of my nation, the Anishinaabek nation. Not only that, Sagmuknishnabek Donjaba. So again, that means the place that I put down my head. It's the place where I was raised. So I was very, very fortunate to grow up in a, in a, in a small community uh, just above Lake Huron here in Ontario. And uh, in my community, it's called Zgamuk. And that means the place of two points joining. I grew up on the res, as many people call, call it. So when I talk today, I'm going to be doing a little bit of stories, a little bit of challenges for you, so that when it, whenever we do talk about a trauma practice framework with Indigenous peoples, that I come to it from a relevant space, from personal experience, and also from a theoretical background and an educator background as well. So my first challenge. Again, to everybody that's you know joining us today on this beautiful fall day is to think about your role holistically, right? So, I mean, it's like, well, how do we develop that lens of holism? So the first thing that we do is that when we think about our roles is that we need to think about our roles as healing. So we need to think about the things about, about our roles, like how is it? So what is the physical component of our roles, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual? So the first challenge I have for you watching is to either record 
or don't record and that's okay too either to write down in some way or else to talk it out with your group you know very quickly to let them know this the first question i have for you is, is comes from the physical domain so my question for you is what is the title of your day-to-day -day job right so just what is that title so i want you just to take a moment to record it or just to think about it and as you're doing that i'll tell you what my title is so i'm an associate professor in a faculty of education i'm a scholar um, and not only am i a scholar but i'm a researcher and i'm also a community person as well so that's the physical now we're going to move on to the emotional which is a part of that holistic lens of looking at our work so who are the people that you service right so who is it um, you know who are the people that you work with daily who is it that are your clients who is it that you see um, and serve daily or weekly or monthly? So is it children? Is it youth? Do you work with families? So who is it? And I'm very fortunate that when I think about my own work, that I work with everybody on that continuum. So again, I get reflect and just think about it, write it down or share it with somebody, the emotional, who are the people that you service? The next part of that, is the intellectual. So we're moving along that holistic wheel. I want you to think about again, what immediate legislation governs your day to day job, because this is a part of that holistic journey, when we're working with indigenous peoples to see our, our work from a different lens. So I want you to think about that. What is the immediate legislation? Is it the Education Act? It is a is it a particular Child and Family Services Act? Is it the criminal code? So again, think about what is the immediate legislation. And if you're like, you know what, right now, like, you know, I, you know, I have a running list of the legislation I got to work with. Well, just put the number one that you work with daily. The last one on that holistic wheel, my friends, that I would like you to record is again, and if you can do it, you can write it or else you can draw it. But how do you help people? Right? So that's a big question. How, how do you help people? Do you help them through your service? Do you help them through intervention, through prevention? What is it that you do? How do you help people? And that's a bigger question that we're going to be answering today, that we're gonna reflect on today as well. So again, we start by, again, viewing our roles as medicine. And we do that physically, emotionally, intellectually, and we do that spiritually. So we're going to go on, and I'm going to set the context, right? So what does setting the context mean? So setting the context means whenever we're working with indigenous populations to look at it, uh, you know, from a variety of perspectives. And the first perspective that I'm going to give you is one that's more qualitative in nature. And there's also going to be a quantitative way to look at the context. So when I think about the qualitative nature of working with Indigenous peoples, the very first context is for us to be able to think about ourselves and to think about the people that we're servicing and working with, but to provide it from a very, very two-legged and human lens. So what that means is this, anytime that I'm working with, whether it be students, whether it be youth, children, elders, you know, the elderly, the first thing that I do to set the context is I need to really know who I am and who am I? Who am I as a human being and as a two-legged? Because when it comes to working with indigenous peoples, children, youth, families, and communities, the most important thing that they're going to want to know is who are you, right? So who are you? How can I relate to you person to person, two-legged to two-legged? So the very first thing that I would say is that number one, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, I'm a cousin. Not only that, my good friends, I'm also a fur mother, you know, I have my fur children and I'm also a woman and a friend. So I start there. And then again, of course, you know, setting the context means to look at, you know, the situation at hand. So it means when working with indigenous families that we have that human to human contact first, and then we can understand the context, right? So that's where we're going to start. So setting the context, we need to know the stats, right? So we need to know who it is that we're working with, the challenges they face, the successes that they have, all of the beautiful things that come with being a two-legged being that exists in this world. So when we look at Indigenous, again, Indigenous communities, and we take a look at the, again, the Canadian context, 
We know that 4.9% of the total population in Canada is Indigenous, and that number has been rising. And that number continues to rise as Indigenous people feel safe to come forward and to say, I am, I'm either First Nations, Métis, or Inuit, or else I know that I'm Indigenous, but I'm not sure from where. And not only that, setting the context means also to know the absolute diversity of Indigenous peoples in Canada. More than 70 languages are spoken, and there are more than 600 unique First Nations communities in Canada alone. And like myself, um, I grew up in Zgamuk, you know, that beautiful little community. But now I live in Sudbury, Ontario, which is also called Nisqwakamuk. So 52 percent, or else a little over half of Indigenous peoples live in metropolitan centres, like the Big Smoke here in Toronto, in Winnipeg, Vancouver, Calgary, Montreal, Charlottetown. So we live in metropolitan areas. And of course, my friends, some of the stats, you know, if you're working with children and youth, you'll know that one third of, again, Indigenous peoples uh, are 14 years of age and younger. And that is a really important thing to know, because in our work, whenever we are working with Indigenous communities and families, we know that, number one, that this is the fastest growing population. And number two, that the majority of the population is quite young. So again, that's setting the context. Not only that, and I know all about this, I mean, I grew up on the res, I grew up in a very wonderful community, um, but also a community that was purposely uh, located outside of the view and lens of, uh, again, of uh, non-Indigenous uh, Canadian citizens. So I grew up in a community that you had to cross a river, go down a dirt road to get to. And uh, I'm also a product, um, you know, of, uh, of um, living on a reserve and uh, which had its advantages and disadvantages. And as we know, um, reserves were created uh, as a result of, of colonialism. And, um, you know, so that we could be put away from, from the site, you know, from the view, from the purview of, uh, again, non-Indigenous Canadians. But I also know the situation. So when I look at the 2016 stats, Again, you know, when, in regards to Indigenous communities and families, I know that one third of Indigenous children under the age of four years live with a lone parent, okay? They have. And not only that, when I take a look at the lone parent situations, is that typically Indigenous children and youth um, also live or have lived with grandparents, right? So again, there's very, very complex family systems that ind Indigenous children and youth live in. And again, you know, there's the statistics part of it, but also there's the, the very real lived component of it. So again, I grew up in a community and um, in my community, a lot of my own cousins and uh, a lot of my own friends lived in these particular family situations. And this is just the reality of our communities that whenever we talked about family, it was never, you know, well, very rarely was it, you know, a family that was like a nuclear family, you know, what was, you know, deemed a traditional nuclear family. But our family units often composed and still do compose of multifamily households on the res or else when we're living in, again, in a metropolitan context that typically what we have is that we have, again, very complex family systems, often grandparents, cousins, aunties and uncles and again just a, a definition of aunties and uncles is that often very significant caregivers in uh, indigenous children and youth lives um, typically can be those that are not even uh, related by blood so often we'll have we have people we call aunties or uncles that are actually like you know significant caregivers again in our lives but they are individuals you know that have been adopted into the family or else they are family members by clan or else by dodum so often it's not just a biological again like you know family unit but again very complex family system systems in place so some of the critical issues so again working with Indigenous, again, children, youth, and families, is that we need to think, well, what is facing the children and youth and families that we're going to be working with? And I, I know all about this, you know, I grew up in it, um, I'm faced with it, again, every day, um, as a community member, as a family member, and as a scholar. 
Um, so when I think about the social determinants of health, right? So we think about, it's almost like this, this checklist, but often at times it's almost like, you know, a checklist, you know, that, that when I look at it, that it's a checklist that, that can be hurtful, but it's also a checklist that's informative. And when I think about the social determinants of health, you think about things related to poverty, employment, working conditions, literacy levels, social status housing, you know, adequate housing. When we think about things like food security, access to good health services, trust in actual support services. When we think about, you know, again, language and things of that nature. When we look at Indigenous children and youth, and when we compare those social, social determinants of health, we know that Indigenous children and youth are at risk on nearly every one of those social determinants of health. We know that Indigenous children typically live in poverty. We know that, you know, typically, you know, that um, definitely um, when it comes to issues of adequate housing, um, again, and not only that, but food security, that that's typically also a particular challenge that's faced. So the social determinants, when I think about them, and I think about my own community, and I think about the children and youth that I work with throughout, you know, uh, the education system, I mean, these social determinants are very real and, you know, they, they really do. They, they, they're hurtful again, when you, when you hear about them, but you know, these are the realities of uh, the lived experiences of uh, again, um, my community and the people that I work with. So again, those critical issues. So knowing the critical issues and knowing that a particular, <clears throat> again, that particular children and youth are facing, facing these issues are absolutely imperative to know. Now that doesn't mean, you know, that we have a one brush paints all situation, but it's important to have the context, right? To have the context when we're working with the families, really, really important to do that. The next thing I wanna talk about, and this is an interesting one, and uh, it has to do with worldviews and particular worldviews that are always colliding. So again, and these worldviews, you're going to see, you know, again, them colliding every day. So again, this is why I really want to talk about them. So there's two different worldviews. There's traditional worldviews and there's technological worldviews. So again, in Indigenous communities, in our traditional societies, there was particular values that again, that we, you know, would live, we would call it like, you know, the good life. So Anishinaabek people would say, this is the mods win. This is the good life, you know. And every nation, again, like, you know, has their, um, again, their good life values and their worldview, the traditional values. And then we have the technological society, which has their own set of worldviews, right? So the technological world, this modern world that has their own set of worldviews that collide with those traditional worldviews. And the reason why it's important to understand these worldviews is for these reasons, my friend, is because whenever you're doing any types of plans of care, a plan of care typically involves uh, finding ways to connect that child and that family, that youth back to their, again, back to a community, right? So to help them to make those connections back um, to culture and language, right? So to help them to make that, again, that connection. So a plan of care typically, ha typically has that, either whether it's connection to a friendship center or a uh, connection to like a First Nation or also Métis organization, you know, to help with genealogy searches or else whether it's like, you know, a connection, again, like, you know, to um, an Inuit organization for that family member. So I want to talk about where you're going to see this happen. So as a result of colonization, right? So as a result of, you know, the 60s scoop, as a result of residential schooling, as a result of the Indian Act and everything that came with that, you know, the creation of reserves and the creation of enfranchisement, you know, where any of our people who wanted to either, you know, um, you know, sign up, you know, for, for a particular like, you know, uh, peacekeeping roles or whether they wanted to go to school and get higher education before 1970, they had to give up their right, you know, to be Indigenous. And not only that, because of colonization and this type of violence, 
violence against Indigenous peoples. Um, you know, Bill, again, you know, Bill C-31, where Indigenous women were, again, where their rights and their status was taken away before 1985. Because of all of this colonization, you're going to see these worldviews colliding. So traditional values in our communities, which are still highly valued, is again, the concept of community and sharing. So, I mean, I still get this, you know, at home. And I even like, you know, living in like, you know, right outside of Sudbury, because I no longer live on the res, you know, this whole concept of community and sharing, that that comes first. And the conflict comes in a technological society, because what we see is like an overt valuing of individual and property rights. So right there, there's going to be a value conflict, again, for Indigenous children, youth, and their families, especially when either if they're already connected, again, to the community and have those traditional values, or whether they're living in metropolitan areas, have traditional values, or if, you know, they've been immersed in, uh, again, you know, in metropolitan, like, you know, in metropolitan pop culture and community, and they're trying to reach back to traditions, that these are where these particular worldviews will collide. So again, very opposite, you know, sides of the spectrum. So not only that, traditionally, cooperation, right? Cooperation is key. And what happens is, is that cooperation is a value that is like something that is so important, you know, cooperation, to be able to get along with each other, you know, and some people will call that like, you know, non-interference, but it's not so much non-interference, but you know, what it is, is that we have particular traditional systems in place in our communities that would help to regulate good behavior and bad behavior, or else what would be like, you know, unacceptable norms. So again, we have the cooperation and then you look at technological society and the systems that we have here, including like, you know, schooling or else whatever it is, is that competition, you know, is like, you know, something that is so important, right? So it's something that a lot of our families are faced with every day. So again, this is these understanding these worldviews are really important in developing plans of care and working uh, with children, youth and families that are Indigenous. And again, the sacred. This is really important because the challenge that I put out when we first began was that we had to start from a holistic, again, approach, right? So we had to start with that beautiful physical, emotional, intellectual, intellectual, and again, again, uh, the spiritual. So the sacred is present everywhere. You know, it is not separate from anything. And the reason why this is important is because what we see in technological societies is that there's actually a separation. There's the sacred and the secular. So the sacred becomes institutionalized, right? And so when we're trying to connect back, uh, again, Indigenous children and youth and their families, again, you know, to, to community, um, you know, through friendship centers, Métis organizations, First Nations, or else Inuit organizations, we need to be aware that there's going to be, again, these particular worldviews colliding. Not only that, traditional societies, silence is valued. Um, and we live in a society where talk, talk, talk is something that is highly valued. And that often in technological societies, we're actually uncomfortable with silence. We feel the need to fill that void. Oh, we just got to keep filling it no matter what. Traditional societies, we have that. The silence is okay. It's okay to sit in silence with somebody. Not only that, humor is trust. So when we do our plans of care that I'll be showing again in a couple of minutes, absolutely critical to know that humor is trust and respectful humor. So when an indigenous uh, child, youth or family member starts to, you know, to, to joke around with us in a good way, that's a sign of trust. Technological society will tell us humor has its place. So that's why it's absolutely critical to understand these worldviews. Not only that, eye contact, I get this all the time. So especially when we're working in places, right, whenever we're doing like, you know, cases or else we're doing intakes or else, you know, we're helping prepare for court is that here's the big thing. Oh, eye contact and technological societies. We assume that if you're making eye contact, it must be true. You must be telling the truth. And here's the, um, the reality in our traditional societies is that even back home, eye contact is not necessary. I don't need to be looking at you right in the eye to know that we're communicating or that I'm telling the truth, 
right? So that it's eye contact is not necessary. So that's again, like a particular worldview colliding. And then again, this one um, really important is again, traditional societies, we value aging, we value getting old. Technological society really, again, um, values, again, staying young, being youthful, and really like, you know, values youth. So whenever we're working with, again, Indigenous children and youth, the most, again, one of the really important things to remember is to remember the entire family unit. And that when we approach, again, you know, our work, that we're working with an entire unit, an entire community, that it's not just about the child and the youth and family, but this is also about community. So the next thing that I would like to talk about again, my good friends, is that again, moving on from those worldviews colliding, is I want to talk about some practices. So when we're engaging with Indigenous children, youth and their families, is that to think about some of the things about our language. So how it is that we're speaking, and any of the resources, I'll let you know ahead of time, that I'm using throughout this presentation are right at the end of the PowerPoint and there's a link to it so that you know that it's, it's, it's um, okay as you're following along. If you're like, okay, I need a little bit of a break, I'm going to go download this document then just go right to, you know, to the end if you've downloaded the PowerPoint and you can get access to that document. But everything, again, has a hyperlink at the end. So, language. Any time that we're working with Indigenous children, youth, and their families. So again, always think about, you know, that, that English may not necessarily be the strongest language. And there's actually all kinds of research that talks about, you know, the fact that English and French is often viewed as a second, uh, you know, is often viewed as a second dialect. So English might not be the strongest language. So again, one of the most important things is, you know, as part of like, you know, doing intakes or case conferencing or else, you know, you get information on the families is also, you know, to find out even a basic greeting in the language or else, you know, to have a language ally with you and language allies. So again, if someone speaks Anishinaabemwin or else if they speak Ungwe Hungwe, which is the language of the Haudenosaunee people, is that you can access language allies by being in contact with your local, again, Indigenous Friendship Center, local First Nation, a local Métis organization, if you want to have a word in the chief, and also your local Inuit, again, organization to have a basic greeting. So again, using a basic greeting can set the stage for again, a less threatening dialogue. What you do is that you enter into it by saying, you know what, I've taken the time to learn. You know, I've taken that extra step. So again, I always say anything, you know, um, that you're going to present written materials, um, anything like that is, you know, um, avoid the use of acronyms. We're in a society where, oh my goodness, acronyms are everywhere. Oh my goodness, well, you know, we got this funding out of the PFL at the Maisie, at the MTCU, from the prop here, there, ABC. Indigenous people are not interested in the acronyms that you're using. But you know what, tell it like it is, you know, and just be factual and be literal about it. So again, consider that, consider the reading and the use of the documents as well. Just, you know, keep it to the point and keep it factual. The other part of language and also when you're engaging my friends um, with Indigenous uh, uh, peoples is also, you know, to never make uh, what I would say is promises you can't keep. And this is going to go right into the question. So you see that slide right now. Don't make promises you can't keep. The most important thing when working with Indigenous children, youth and families is to let them know that you're going to do the best you can. And that's OK. And know that it's also OK to say, I don't know, you know, but I will work on finding out. So, again, don't make promises that you can't keep. Some of the questions. So, again, this is coming from um, a great document called The Other Side of the Door. Any questions that you're asking, um, you know, make sure that they build on, again, that family, that child, that youth and their background. Um, we understand and we know that this child and uh, or else this young person or the family, they are their own expert in their own life, you know, so so they are so they are that expert and that what we are is that we are, you know, that facilitator, we are that helper, we're that healer. And listen, if the answers you're being provided with are not clear, it's okay to ask deeper questions, you know? And also, again, it's important to also be able to read body language, you know? So again, the other part of it is that often a lot of our people, we need time, you know, when we're asked questions. 
we need time to think about it and reflect. It's not that we don't know. It's just that we need that time to think, reflect, and then provide that answer. And when we're working with children and youth, know that often if we're asking a question, that that child also needs to be allowed, you know, to draw it out, to have other options to answer the question other than just by, you know, oral language. And also um, that family, you know, you, you need to be prepared to answer questions. And if you don't know, um, then you need to say that, that you don't know, but you're willing to find out. Not only that, and I get this, you know, so the history. So the history with external agencies or else the history often with, again, like, you know, um, with non-Indigenous structures or representatives of non-Indigenous structures has not always been good. And, um, you know, it's not just, you know, the residential schools, the 60s scoop, um, Indian agents, you know, um, and whatever other forces that represent external agencies. But it's also, um, you know, that um, that Indigenous children, youth, and families, you know, might not have had good relationships with schools. They might not have had good relationships with teachers. And recognize, you know, that 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 is a reality. And so, so what's going to happen is that when you're in a role and you're servicing and working with, you know, all of our diverse and beautiful Indigenous peoples, absolutely, you know, absolutely, the key is to recognize that history and know that you may require, um, you know, on your part to do a bit more work in terms of understanding, um, you know, studying the history or even bringing other support people in to work again with that child, youth and family. So what does that mean? It means having Indigenous advocates. It means knowing the community that you're working with. It means searching out. It means like, well, what is the local friendship center? What is like, you know, the local, um, you know, again, Better Beginnings program? What is like, you know, even like, you know, the local liaison with police services that's Indigenous? It may mean also knowing like, you know, who is like, you know, the local person that's working on the Gladu reports that's Indigenous. It may mean so many things, but it means that knowing who are the Indigenous services in the area and who are the Indigenous advocates, because it's those Indigenous advocates and services that are absolutely fundamental, again, you know, to working with that family, because the history is that we have not had good relationships with, with non-Indigenous agencies. So absolutely critical. The other thing, again, so again, from again, uh, the other side of the door, is to think about when we're doing our plans of care and thank goodness for Jordan's principle. So Jordan's principle and uh, many of us that work, you know, with children and youth and Indigenous families will know that Jordan's principle is this. It's where no matter what, right? So whenever a situation comes up with, uh, again, with Indigenous children, no matter where they are, is that instead of, you know, um, a particular agency or else a service or else a department trying to figure out, you know, where that child, youth and family member, you know, should be situated, is that the very first contact point is where that service is provided and paid for. Then again, it's a child first principle. So that is really important to know um, because Jordan's principle, you know, is, is something that is, again, very Indigenous focused. It's based upon like, you know, definitely, you know, um, trying to resolve those jurisdictional disputes involving the care of Indigenous children. So it means that the very first contact point provides that service, pays for that service, and then can seek reimbursement afterwards. And again, Jordan's principle is like something absolutely key to know when we work again with Indigenous children, youth and families. The other thing, the other side of the door. So again, developing plans of care. Every Indigenous child, every Indigenous youth, you know, no matter what, has an Indigenous affiliation or a home community, right? So they always do. So the, the, the whole thing is, is that it's important, you know, to, to know what that affiliation is. And if that particular family is struggling or maybe does not know what that affiliation is, then the next best thing is to connect them again with that Indigenous advocate or else Indigenous ally, because that is where they will find, you know, um, those good cultural teachings 
they'll find, you know, a support community, you know, that that can help them along in their own cultural and linguistic journey, right? So that's really important, again, to make, to know what the home, what the, the ancestry and affiliation is, but also to connect them so that they can also have, you know, access to resources to help them, you know, to, to um, again, to understand various teachings, to go to workshops with other people, to understand culture, traditions, and language. So part of a good plan of care also is to understand, again, and do an assessment of the, the current cultural connections of that child and youth. So again, it's just, you know, finding out basic things. So how do they self-identify? How does that child or youth? And I'm going to tell you that at the very beginning, whenever we have that first contact with uh, Indigenous children, youth, and families, it is not often that people are going to self-identify right away. So you need to know that because what happens is that there needs to be a relationship built between yourself and that child, youth and family before a lot of, you know, a lot of that divulging is going to happen. So again, part of that plan of care is, okay, well, again, what is, you know, the, that cultural connection? So again, how do they self-identify, you know, and then finding the evidence, okay, they self-identify as this, and also to make sure that, um, that uh, you also, you know, have those connections to those elders, Métis senators, cultural resource people, knowledge keepers in the area that can also support that cultural connection for that child, youth, and family, okay? Absolutely um, critical to do that. And it is that, again, that community resource, you know, that community resource that is going to be able to do that, right? So again, it's all about ensuring that we have those connections. So that cultural plan, first of all, it means that, um, you know, Part of that cultural plan um, is also going to be very reciprocal. So when we're doing cultural plans, I mean, yourself too, as the individual engaging with the child, youth and family, you yourself as the individual is also going to go through your own journey of learning and healing altogether as well, because any of our relationships in our work, you know, we have a professional relationship, but we can't help but affect, be affected, reflect and learn ourselves, right? And that's part of that holistic journey, you know, and a part of that, that work that we, we all do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. And this is what's called carrying our own personal and organizational bundle, right? So what that means is that we take everything that we've learned and, you know, whether it's like, you know, um, the skills, our values, community connections, our training, that this is our bundle. This is what we bring to that relationship because that's what it is, a relationship with that child, youth and family, right? So that personal bundle, everything that we are, we bring to that relationship and role. So again, that cultural plan is also making sure that, um, again, that as part of that, again, um, a cultural plan is that, um, you know, knowing what the Friendship Center has to offer. What is the home community or the First Nation or Métis community or Inuit community? What do they have to offer? So what kind of events are, ha are happening? So again, that's why it's really important to ensure that there is some form of, again, partnering. Okay, so absolutely key. Now, I was a part of this document. It's called The Child Becomes Strong. And when we're working with Indigenous children, youth and families, it's really important to understand that each community, right? So, you know, we have 600 various nations, First Nations here in uh, Canada, um, and we have over 70 distinct languages. But it's also important to understand that every nation has their own um, almost like a um, milestones in, in a two-legged or also human being's life. So most nations have a very similar um, way of uh, viewing the, uh, our, our life and how we go about, um, you know, living, living our life here in this world. So again, this comes from a document called A Child Becomes Strong. So when you're working with children, right? So for Anishinaabek, and you'll see like in other cultures, so that's why it's important to connect with your local indigenous, uh, you know, organizations, is that we often call the, uh, the first seven years of life the good life. So why do we call it that, right? Because again, the good life, 
that's when, you know, typically everybody surrounds, you know, that child right from the beginning, right? Right from, you know, you know, that the birth. So that's when like, you know, the elders, the aunties, the uncles, the grandmothers, they're all supporting, you know, that, that parent and what they're doing is they're providing for all needs of that child, the physical, you know, the emotional, the intellectual and the spiritual needs of that child. And the first seven years are the most critical time in a child's development. So this is why the good life, we talk about this and why when you're working with, again, Indigenous children and youth, it's important to know that this is why as part of a plan of care, that again, that those elders, that those grandmothers, and that, um, that they need to be involved. And that's why those connections to Indigenous resources are absolutely key. Because the good life, you know, when we talk about Bamadzwin and living that good life, it marks the, a very important time in a child's um, holistic development, right? And it's like, you know, it sets the foundation for who they are and who they are becoming. So again, my friends, the good life. The other, again, which is interesting when we're working with youth, is that we call this, right? So again, children to youth, we call this the fast life. And this is approximately ages seven to 14. And really the fast life is this, it is, you know, celebrating, you know, that transition from being a child and now we're going to become a young adult, right? So we're still a child at age seven and then we're going through, you know, our journey and our beautiful life journey. And we see it, you know, when children are seven, we start to see that almost like this awkwardness, right? They start to go through all of these physical changes, you know, they start to lose their teeth and things like that. And they go through awkwardness. But what's interesting, they make that journey and then about, you know, 13, 14, you know, they start to go through some pretty major physical changes. But what's interesting about the fast life and when we're working with that population in our, our daily, weekly, monthly work is that this is the time that the self-esteem of that child and youth is, again, the most affected, absolutely most affected, right? So that's why we need to make sure that we have supports in place when, again, indigenous, indigenous children and youth are going through the fast life, that they have supports in their life that's about self-esteem. They have people, they have resources, they have events, and they have plans of care that ensure that it's all about their self-esteem. It's about helping them to explore their gifts. It's about, you know, helping them feel safe and secure. So when we think about our work, right, and our work bundles, that's why I'm saying it's absolutely critical, my friends, that, uh, you know, that we consider the life stage they're typically at. Then we have the wandering life. Oh, my goodness, 15 to 21. And again, this is where they start to question their life's purpose, right? The wandering life. So again, it's time when they test their limits. And again, and this is where they start to discover the consequences for their behaviors, right? So it's important that, that at this stage, that um, youth in this stage, that they understand that every decision they make has either a consequence or else a benefit. But no matter what, that there is always an action um, for every decision that is made. So again, some people call it the wandering years. So a um, couple things. And again, this comes from a document called the middle years uh, that's based out of here in Ontario. So some of the things that, again, that, that we would see. So when I talk about the spiritual domain, right? So when we're working with, uh, again, you know, Indigenous children, youth and families, these are the things we would see in that, that, that plan, right? Some of the things that you would incorporate, some of the things that you would be doing is that we would see, again, the inclusion of elders and Métis senators and cultural resource people. Not only that, we would see that a lot of our meetings, visits, or case conferencing, you know, no matter what, you know, that those would be in places of significance to the family. So in locations of safety that are identified by the family. And that's really important. It may mean engaging in a land-based activity that reinforces that cultural teaching. So again, it's really important to make sure that it's places of significance to the family. And not only that, but places of significance that are culturally relevant. So again, and those come uh, directly from your Indigenous contacts. 
It's also knowing and having understanding and compassion for the intergenerational impacts that that family uh, faces, right? So that that they have, um, you know, inherited, you know, um, these these impacts and also all of these things that came from residential schools in the 60s scoop. So it's understanding that. And that's why those GLAD-U reports are absolutely critical to also, you know, to understand the nature of those. It's also understanding that your own relationship with that family, it is actually one that's going to be uh, not just, you know, one or two times or a couple of months, but it's a sacred relationship between you and that family, eh? that child and youth, and that the effects of that relationship is going to be felt for years to come. Not only that, when we go to the emotional, so we're making that journey again, eh? So we, you know, we're making that journey holistically. So again, looking at your work with Indigenous families through a holistic lens. So the emotional, it's knowing that respectful humor is a way to establish connection, right? And that's what it is. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we say, well, we have a professional relationship. Working with Indigenous families, you know, children and youth, often the informal and the formal part of the relationship becomes blurred. And, you know, that's something, you know, that we have to negotiate and navigate within ourselves. But it's really important to know that, um, you know, that that um, that relationship is not only going to be sacred, but it's also going to be a very personal one that's going to be ongoing. Again, not only that is that it's important to again have that partnership with the families and the communities and plan activities together it may mean you know um, celebrating milestones in that child's life it may mean you know celebrating a birthday that they never got to celebrate you know it may be you know participating in a traditional rite of passage that that child's going to go through and what a gift that that is to be able to do that you know to be able to be in that traditional rite of passage or to be a part of that journey if you're asked to be a part of it not only that it's also important for you as a professional you know no matter what to share your own life story as a way to connect with the family and that child. Who are you as a human being, as a two-legged? You know, what are your hobbies? Do you have pets? You know, are there special memories that you have when you were that age? So those are really important to share as, as well. The intellectual, so we're going again, making that journey, again, that holistic journey. The intellectual means is that it's important, any of the materials that you have when working with the families, whether it's books, forms, whatever it is, any resource that you have, you know, that there's Indigenous voices present, right? You need to have that. You need to have Indigenous voices that they can see and relate to. Not only that, ongoing check-ins, informal and formal, you know, seeing like, you know, again, how are, the, how are they doing, you know? What are the benefits? What are the areas for growth, you know, throughout like, you know, the work that they've, you know, that they've been doing with you. Not only that, communication strategies and working with the families, you need to make sure that you have hands-on activities, that things are done in many lessons and that the families have time, children and youth to reflect and also to answer things in a variety of ways, right? So not just by always talking, but you know, that they be allowed to draw or else, you know, through drama, that there's other ways to do it through life stories, through life mapping. Not only that, the intellectual, again, making sure that there's diverse experiences, provide quality time for that family. So that's the intellectual. So again, the physical, take a look at your own buildings. Let's take a look at the spaces that they're entering into, right? So again, do your own spaces have um, posters and messages and symbols, you know, that are in the Indigenous languages of the territory of which you're building um, or your space is located on? Because even if that family is not fluent in their own languages or else in their own cultures, the fact is, is that seeing that signage right away, you know, provides almost like, you know, it's almost like going like this, you know, welcome, right? So that's what it is. And also because of, again, uh, you know, issues related to food security, you need to make sure that meals and snacks are provided, right? So make sure that that happens, you know, and that's just, that's part of a respectful relationship as well. Again, I spoke about this before, uh, make sure that any communication that it has the original languages. Use a basic greeting, greeting uh, in the indigenous language. You know, ani, tanche, you know, sego, whatever it is. But that means you need to reach out and find out what the basic greetings are. 
I always say starting with traditional land acknowledgements um, to start any type of formal proceeding is also really important. And this goes right back to, uh, you know, the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So it goes right back to those calls for action. And it's a challenge, you know, to, to all formal proceedings to start with a traditional land acknowledgement, right? To start with that. Because what it does, you know, no matter what you do, whatever proceeding, whether it's mediation or else, whether it's court, no matter what it is, and even in your correspondence or at your website, whatever it is, having that traditional land acknowledgement, you know, it, it sends that message. It says, okay, you know, you know, we understand, we, we know the history and what we're going to do is we're going to honor the people of this land. So my sources are there in the order of, of, of appearance, of course. <laughs> But the one thing that I really want to emphasize, and uh, again, you know, is talk about those personal bundles, right? So I had talked about, you know, uh, a personal bundle, but also an organizational bundle. So you just receive some information on a trauma practice framework when working with Indigenous peoples. But some of the things that are really critical to also know is to think about your own personal bundle. What type of training, credentials, teachings, what type of experiences, um, do you have as a person, you know, so so what makes you you as a person and as a professional? And we take those personal bundles, right, because we bring them into our work. And then what we do from there is that we always make sure that we take whatever training that we've received about Indigenous peoples, and that we also, you know, make sure that that training becomes like the jumping off point for us to learn more, right, to learn more because when working with Indigenous children, youth, family, and communities, is that it really becomes a journey for the self. That's really what it is too, is that it becomes a journey about learning about who we are and how we're situated in lands um, that traditionally, um, you know, um, are the lands uh, of Indigenous peoples, right? So we get to understand ourselves. And not only that, as part of understanding ourselves, you know, when we know better, we do better. Right. So that's what it is. When we know better, we do better. So the other part of this, folks, is also because the sacred being so important is to know that there's also this theory. Right. And that's why cultural connections are so important and having children and youth connect to, again, uh, their own culture, their own language, is that there's a lot of, you know, theories about this whole concept of the soul wound. And I fully believe in the soul wound. And what it is, is that because Indigenous children, um, youth and families, have, we've endured so much trauma, you know, we're subjected, you know, to violence daily, whether it's through stereotypes, whether it's, you know, through racism or whatever message or else, you know, through hurtful situations, is that what happens is that when we say we have a soul wound, is that any time that we're hurt, whether intentionally or unintentionally by others, you know, is that a little part of our spirit goes away every time, right? A little part of it keeps going and we become numb, you know, we become really numb to that trauma. So that what happens is that that's why the cultural connection is so significant is because what we need to do is that it's it's the culture, it's those connections, the teachings to the elders, Métis senators, the knowledge keepers, and that beautiful Indigenous story and those contributions that bring those parts back, you know. So, oh, I learned about the good life today. I'm going to bring that back. Oh, I got to participate in a powwow. I'm going to bring that back. Oh, today I got to celebrate Orange Shirt Day and felt validated bring that back. Oh, you know, today, you know, I got to learn a word in my language. It comes back here. So again, the soul wound. And we get to, we get to be a part of such a beautiful journey, you know, and often whenever we are working with Indigenous children, youth and families, it's often in, tra in traumatic situations, right? But we're, we also are in a unique and uh, very meaningful position, um, you know, to, to ensure that um that there's growth and uh not only that 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 family is empowered right that they're empowered um you know and that they're empowered through not only the work that you're doing and to be of assistance to be a facilitator but also that they are empowered through culture and language and tradition and that's absolutely key so think about your own personal bundle and think about your organizational bundle and reflect upon those things, right? So think about that training. Think about your own cultural competency practices, your own human rights work, conflict resolution, anti-racism. 
think about all of those things that you bring to that training and, you know, and uh, make sure that you always share um, who you are as that two legged, because that is the very first entry point to having a family, um, you know, that's in trauma, child in trauma, or else a youth feel like, you know, that you are approachable, you know, and also, again, don't be afraid to say, I don't know, or else I'm going to do the best that I can, you know, because that's really important, because that relationship that you have is one that's going to be, uh, it's going to be a long term relationship. And it's going to be one that's going to be about your own journey as well. So with that, I'd like to say miigwech um, to everybody, which is thank you in my language, uh, because I am also in Haudenosaunee territory here. Um, because I am in the one dish, one spoon treaty territory here in Toronto. So I'd like to say thank you in both of those languages and also merci beaucoup and uh, thank you. Oh, this is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So I do have um, one like, you know, do you have any guidance or suggestions about sharing information about yourself? So that's a really, really good, uh, good question to have. So what I often would say, right, is um, so it depends upon uh, where it is, like the location of safety that you're meeting the family with. So typically, I mean, you know, what we do is that we often like have pictures of our families or else things like that, like, you know, around our, our desk areas or else, you know, at least so I would hope so to add a personal element, but also to find opportunities like, you know, as soon as like, you know, you're doing, um, uh, the, you know, a case conferencing or else you meet the family for the safe the first time is again to try to use, you know, the language uh, you introduce yourself. And always let them know from the very beginning, you know, um, you know, besides like, you know, who you are and, you know, your, your particular title, um, but also letting them know like, yeah, like, you know, I, I too, like, you know, I, I'm also an uncle or else, you know, I too have, you know, a child or else a nephew your age or else, you know, I, I'm very lucky, you know, to be involved, like, you know, um, you know, in, in so-and-so's without naming people's lives. So it's important to be able to find those opportunities to insert that or else like, you know, as part of, you know, your case conference, you know, if that child, you know, you know, talks about, you know, a, a very a happy memory or something like that, that you can relate to that, you know, oh yeah, I can relate, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to being by the water, you know, you know, I spend a lot of time on my days off by the water. So that's what I mean about those, those particular, again, you know, opportunities, right? And also children are very, very uh, curious anyway. So whenever they see something on your desk, you know, something that's of interest, they're going to be right away. Well, you know, who is that, you know, but finding that, but, but also don't be afraid to say up front, you know, yeah, I am like, you know, I'm a parent, I'm an auntie, whatever it is, or else like, you know, being able to do that or else, you know, yeah, like, you know, I have like, you know, or else I'm, I'm a fur mother, whatever it is, or fur parent, whatever it is you want to say. I also see another one, one. Okay. Yeah, so this is a good one. So this has to do with the traditional greetings. So what if you're not sure if the person knows their traditional language? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's actually a good one. So would uh, could you be using the traditional greeting make them uncomfortable? So yeah, there is there is the potential that using that greeting may make them uncomfortable. But this is how I would always preface it, right? So I always say on need to people and uh, in my area, like, you know, because the Shinobic territory. So using that greeting, like, you know, I would say like, you know, on need. And um, if a person doesn't know that, and I'd say, you know, I said, you know, that, that uh, you know, that is Nishnabek, you know, for hello. And, uh, and I'm learning, I'm learning my language or else I'm learning the language as I go along, you know. So that's what I would say is that I would use the greeting. And uh, if they don't know their own language is that, and, and that's okay, is to say, you know what, I'm learning, you know, and I'm trying to learn as well. So I think that being upfront saying that you too are learning I think is absolutely key, right? So that's, I think, that piece of saying that you're vulnerable as well is important, right? Saying, you know, I, I'm learning. We have another question that came here. Oh, that's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the question that came is if you have a youth who doesn't want to acknowledge their Indigenous culture, so again, what is like, you know, a, a really good first step? So this is absolutely, um, you know, absolutely critical. So there are, right, there are Indigenous youth, there's Indigenous folks um, that either 
um, don't come from a place of pride or just, you know, don't want to acknowledge, you know, again, that they're Indigenous or else, you know, what their cultural background is. But I also think so, so often what's interesting is that when I work with Indigenous youth, especially in schools, one of the things is that I often, um, one of the things that I'll have playing like in the background or else that I'll share like, you know, with, with uh, Indigenous youth, my first step is always music, right? So music, of course. Um, so I'll often like, you know, have appropriate music, like, you know, um, a tribe called Red, you know, playing and uh, which like, you know, is Indigenous rap. And, um, and typically, you know, and uh, Indigenous youth, because they have an affinity to music, right, an affinity towards pop culture, is that that's something that's always a first step for me, is the sharing, like, you know, of music. Um, so that's one thing. But not only that, if they don't want to acknowledge that, um, that their Indigenous uh, culture or self self-identification at the beginning that I think that it's important to like, just to be patient, right? To be patient, but also to still have those symbols that are indigenous around, whether it's posters from Inspire, um, you know, of role models, or else whether it's like, you know, um, a particular indigenous greeting or some kind of symbol that's indigenous. But I often have music playing in the background too, right? And uh, A Tribe Called Red, but there's several other beautiful indigenous artists. And often, you know, uh, this is what's interesting because, I mean, I work in K-12 a lot and um, I find that once um, Indigenous children and youth start to feel safe, right, it's amazing. And, and it's not even that. It's, it's when, when, when children and youth really start to feel safe with a person and in an environment, it's amazing how, how they start to self-identify, right? So again, that's why it's about the relationship. But again, the first step, my friends, would be like, you know, to have those images around the messages, still be able to provide that opportunity. But I always say, like, you know, I always look at the the, the group that I'm working with. And if it's youth, I typically use music as an entry point. Right. And then it's like, what? The tribe called Red. And it's like, yeah, they're indigenous. There's also another wonderful, like, you know, band, youth band, actually, that comes from Ottawa, Piscat. Um, So that's why that's an entry point. So folks, miigwech, it is time for me to sign off and I wish everybody well on your journeys and uh, have a good weekend. And um, again, we're um, beautiful time of the year. So again, I will see everybody. So bomb on P, which means see you later.